Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to the souls that made things happen. We were brought to you on the Parix Radio Network. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I will be doing the channeling tonight. And I'm Connie Strom, your co-host. In our last show, we channeled three incredible women that changed our lives. Harriet Tubman, Margaret Sanger, and Susan B. Anthony. The video is available on our YouTube channel. The channel's in Barry's name and has over 530 videos. If you'd like to download the videos, just go to Podomatic.com and search Channeling History. So please tell your friends about us so we can continue to grow our audience because we, we think that our guests really put some good information out there for you all. Tonight we're going to be channeling the spirits of Howard Hughes and his wife, the actress Jean Peters. Howard Hughes was an aviation pioneer and a movie producer that became a billionaire and an eccentric recluse. We think you'll enjoy hearing about his story. So we're going to give a disclaimer tonight to the opinions or statements voiced on our show or the channel words of the spirit and do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network or of our sponsors. So before Con before we channel, <clears throat> we always say a prayer of protection. So Connie, say the prayer and we will begin to channel with the guests that we have tonight. Okay. I'm looking forward to this. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. Okay, Connie, let's, uh, we have a good show tonight, so let's get started with it. Howard Hughes was born in 1905, and he died in 1976 at the age of 70. He was an American aerospace engineer, businessman, filmmaker, investor, philanthropist, and pilot. Through his investments, he was one of the richest and most influential people in the world during his life. He was a very, very important person in the history of early aviation. So, Connie, I know Howard's here with us. So let's begin. Yes. Howard, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, would you like to begin with a message for our listeners? <clears throat> yes, I would. First, I would like to thank you. I know that many people have forgotten the name Howard Hughes, but there was a time that I was a fairly important person. I was a pioneer in aviation. I was enthralled with it from the time I was a child. I set many world records. Now, the records seem very small today compared with what your modern aircraft can do. But keep in mind, during the 20s and 30s, the equipment that we had was very primitive. No radar. We had to do our, a lot of our own navigation. And the technology for the equipment was very primitive. So thank you so much for allowing me. I know you have a bunch of questions. So why don't we just proceed with them? Okay. Let's start with your father. Howard Hughes Sr. founded <clears throat> the Hughes Tool Company in 1909 and produced roller bits for the petroleum industry. How did your father's business influence your life? My father was an incredible businessman. He saw things that other people did not see. And he designed a special piece of equipment for the petroleum industry. In the early days, drilling for oil was a real problem. He designed a roller bit that made it much easier for people 
to drill for oil, and he patented it and made a lot of money off of it. The size of his estate when he passed was considerable, and I inherited about three-quarters of the money. And that gave me the foundation for a lot of my business investments and for a lot of the research that I did. Will you tell us about your education, please? I dropped out of college <clears throat> because I wanted to pursue aviation. I had the opportunity to speak with a lot of important people in the field, and I realized at an early age that it was something that I wanted to do. So I really was not highly educated, but if I must say so myself, I was relatively intelligent. I studied many things. I read. I did a lot of my homework before I invested and I think that I did not do too bad for myself. I would have to agree with that, sir. Uh, what were your early business aspirations? <clears throat> well, first of all, I loved aviation. I became a pilot at a very early age, and I loved to fly. But it was the beginning of the golden age of the movies, there was something about the film industry that intrigued me. And I realized that it would be an area that had great possibilities. There were very few studios at the time. Just several people controlled the industry. And I felt that the work they were doing, <clears throat> in many instances, was amateurish. And... I felt that as a producer, I could bring new technologies and new, t new techniques to the business. So I decided that I would go into the film industry. Yeah, could you go into a little more detail about what the film industry was like in the 20s and 30s? There were no rules. The... There were several individuals that controlled it. The techniques were changing very rapidly. We had just come from silent film to film where you, were, where you could talk. So there were great advances compared to what you see today in your industry. <clears throat> but it was wide open. If you had some money and had some friends, you could get into it. There were not a lot of theaters. You had to make your own distribution deals, but it was a wide open industry. Could you tell us about film censorship back in those days? <clears throat> in those days, censorship was a real thing. The government watched what, watched what was being shown on the screens you had to be very careful about what you did. I was always pushing the censorship limits, and I often had many fights with the people that were doing censorship. I actually had the release of some of my movies delayed because they thought they were too daring. But it was by being on the cutting edge that people wanted to see my work. So... Censorship was indeed a problem for us. It obviously is not a problem today. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, will you tell us about your first short film that you produced, Swell Hogan? <clears throat> a friend of mine convinced me that, this movie, that I should make this movie called Swell Hogan. It was a disaster. It was a commercial failure. <clears throat> and it was very depressing for my first movie. It almost put me out of the movie business, but I decided that I would move ahead. And some of the movies that I made actually had some Academy Award nominations. It's a good thing you hung in there. To what do you attribute your success in the film industry? <clears throat> I always had this great attention to detail. <clears throat> I think, well, I know 
that I actually was OCD. But in many respects, it helped me in the movies, and in many respects, it did not. <clears throat> I would often spend a lot of time on in what the people that worked for me considered insignificant details. But I think there was this attention to detail that made me very, very, very much a success. And many of the famous actresses and actresses would come to me and would want to work for me because of my my work ethic. In 1932, you founded the Hughes Aircraft Company. What role did that company play in World War II? We had many government contracts during World War II. I was building airplanes at the time, and I was doing a lot of research in weaponry. I was doing a lot of work in equipment for navigation. We did many, many things for the government. It was the government was also a great source of income for us during that period, but I think that we did much to help the war effort. Okay. You set various land speed records flying airplanes of your design. In which record do you take the most pride? The one where I flew around the world. We did it in a little over 90 hours. Now, that doesn't seem much today for the equipment that you have. But we had to stop to refuel. We had to, we had limited distances we could fly. <clears throat> and the previous record was almost twice of what we did it in. In those days, aviation was in its infancy. And much of the records that were established seem very insignificant today. But flying around the world when we did it was a huge success. We gained great publicity from it. There were parades in New York. And after I accomplished the feat, my name became very, very well known. And it opened many doors for me in my aviation business. You were involved in four different airplane wrecks, one of which almost took your life. How did the effects <clears throat> of those accidents affect your life? Well, a couple of them were fairly minor. But then I had the big one. I was very badly injured. I had major burns, broken bones. I had injuries to my head. The doctors actually did not think that I was going to make it. It took a long time to recover, but it left me with chronic pain. In those days, surgery techniques were obviously not what they are today. And the surgeons were the best in their time, but there was only so much they could do. The chronic pain caused me huge problems. It forced, I was put on different meds. At that time, people didn't understand the true effects of addiction. And I kept trying to take stronger and stronger painkillers. It was... It was probably a miracle that I lived, but the after effects of it caused me incredible problems for the rest of my life. What inspired you to set up the Hughes Medical Institute? <clears throat> well, there were several reasons, one of which was that I could save in taxes. I shouldn't say that, <clears throat> but... I put the stock of my tool, comp my tool company 
into a nonprofit. And because it was owned by a nonprofit, we did not have to pay taxes on it. So it allowed us to make a lot of investment in equipment. But I also wanted to do medical research. I felt that my father's life could have been saved had there been better techniques. So I set a large amount of money aside that was dead, that should be dedicated to scientific research in the medical field. The Institute is still very, very active today. It invests close to a billion dollars a year in different ways to help scientists. It promotes research in different areas, and it has grown into a very major institution. So yes, I did want to do medical research to help others. I felt that there was a possibility that perhaps some of the research could help me. But yes, there was also a business reason why, why we started it. In 1948, you gained control of RKO Studio and immediately dismissed 700 employees. Why did you take such an action? I wanted to make sure that the employees that worked at RKO were in line with my political beliefs, for one thing. I wanted to make sure that none of them had any communist affiliations. And in those days the communists were trying to organize certain unions and do certain things. I felt that it would be better to basically start over, rehire the ones that I wanted to, and bring new, new blood into the business. It was probably a mistake because it certainly delayed a lot of f production of our films. Howard, did you dislike child actors? Yes. <clears throat> Actually, I thought they were a pain in the ass. <laughs> you had to cater to them. You never knew if they were going to be emotional or not. Some of them were lousy actors. And it's very hard to get a child actor to pay attention to details. Much of what we did was very, very detailed-oriented. <clears throat> and I just did not want to work with them. I thought that they brought risk to a movie. I thought that when you were using child actors, you did not have the control over them that you needed. What were your beliefs in God? <clears throat> I never truly knew what to believe in God. I think the best way to describe me would be to call me an agnostic. <clears throat> I didn't fully believe that God existed, but I fully didn't believe that he didn't. After my accident, I felt that it, the possibility of divine intervention was very great, but I think the best way to describe my belief would be as an agnostic. Okay. <coughs> Will you tell us about your political views? I believe very strongly in our country. I hated communism. I thought that our political system was the best in the world. I thought that capitalism was the best way to run a country. <clears throat> I wanted to make sure that people with my conservative views were in office. I made large donations to politicians. <clears throat> but I wanted people in political office that agreed with my positions. You were married to Jean Peters from 1957 to 1971. <clears throat> Will you tell us about Jean? 
Gene was a wonderful person and is still a wonderful soul. I see her quite often over here on this side. I think that Jean was probably the only person that I ever truly loved. When you're the owner of a movie studio, you get to date the most beautiful women in the world. I had a long history of dating beautiful women. Many of them were self-centered. Jean was always a beautiful person. Not only was she a beautiful physical woman, but she had a wonderful personality. She wanted to help others. After we were married, she did a lot of charity work. She ended her acting career when we got married. <clears throat> Jean was one of the best things that ever happened in my life. I was too stupid to understand it in many ways. I was beginning to have my mental problems when we got married. She stuck with me for many years through many bizarre circumstances, and I have nothing but good to say for her. So you would say that she was the love of your life? Absolutely. No other woman could compare. There were many times that we just simply were friends before we got married. I had my security people watch out for her and take care of her. <clears throat> but I would say that she truly was the love of my life. So why did the divorce take place? She could not put up with my idiosyncrasies anymore. I had isolated myself. We would talk, but we would talk on the telephone. It had been a long time since I had physically seen her. <clears throat> I think that she just finally had as much as she could take of of my lifestyle, and I certainly cannot blame her. Yeah. I think you might have answered this question. Why did you give all of the stock of Hughes Aircraft Company to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute? I wanted the institute to be well-funded. As I had said earlier, I had wanted them to, the tool company to be owned by a nonprofit so that there were no tax laws <clears throat> but I wanted to assure the fact that the medical institute would be funded for a long time after my passing. Okay, so as you're sitting <coughs> on the other side and you watched the Howard Hughes Medical Institute sold Hughes Air they sold Hughes Aircraft to General Motors for five point two billion dollars in nineteen ninety seven. What did you think about that? I was delighted. I thought that my plan had worked to perfection. The money that the institute received in nineteen ninety seven was invested wisely and has grown dramatically through the years, but as I watched from over here, I was very pleased with what they did. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute refers to itself as a biomedical research organization and <clears throat> philanthropic that supports the community of researchers, educators, students, and professionals, and it lists net assets of $24 billion dollars. As you watch from over there on the other side, do you approve of the way the Institute is being run today? I feel that with a net worth of that much, I should probably be spending <coughs> more money on a yearly basis than what they do, but they do a huge amount of good. I want them, or I would prefer that they would stay out of politics I do not think that political 
opinions should interfere with what a research organization does. <clears throat> but all in all, I am incredibly proud of what they have done. Yeah. By the late 1950s, you started to withdraw from the public life. <clears throat> Why did you become a recluse? I was under constant pain. I did not want to work with people. I had a good staff. I had people that worked for me. They carried out my wishes. <clears throat> and I was becoming more and more addicted to painkillers. And it was affecting my decision-making in many places. I was doing things that people thought I was becoming insane. And in certain areas, I think that I probably was. <clears throat> I would become addicted to watching certain movies. I would play them over and over. I would eat the same food every day. I think that the accident had affected my OCD. <clears throat> I know that it had given me med medical problems. Sometimes it would hurt to wear clothing. I would often sit without clothing. I would not like to look outside at the sunlight. I became a true recluse, and as time went on, became heavily addicted to drugs. Did you continue to control your businesses as you withdrew from the public life and went through all of that pain? Yes. I had a staff, and... They would carry out my wishes. I would have them bring me the paperwork from the businesses, and I still controlled it, especially in the early days. As time went on, I started to lose health very rapidly. <clears throat> I let the drugs affect my everyday life, and it became a time that I could not make good decisions. But for the majority of the time, I still controlled the organization, made the decisions on the property I want, properties I wanted to purchase, and being a recluse can actually have certain advantages in business negotiations. Hmm. Exactly. How did the OCD affect your life? I know it was not good. I told you that I paid a lot of attention to details in the film industry. Uh. <clears throat> As I became more, or I had more and more physical problems, I became more and more addicted to detail. I did not have the ability to think logically in a wide universe of thought. I would become bogged down in very small details. And there became a time that I had to rely very heavily on my management staff to make decisions. Were you a germaphobe? Yes, I was. I had this mental fear of germs. I did not want to shake hands with people. I would use a tissue to pick an object off the floor. I did not allow people to come in with any dirt. I would go to extremes to make sure 
that did they, they did not bring germs into my environment. I most, there was a period of time towards the end of my life that I was extremely obsessive about all sorts of little details like germs. Okay, you said that you were also addicted to drugs. How bad was that drug addiction? It was complete. I was using needles to inject hard drugs. When I died, even though I was 6'4", I only weighed 95 pounds. People did not recognize me. Drugs had destroyed my kidneys, and it was the kidneys' destruction by the drugs that finally killed me. Will you tell us about your relationship with Richard Nixon? I tried to influence Nixon by working with his brother. I gave him a fairly large loan that he had not repaid in return for political influence. I did not work directly with Nixon, but he had no idea how much I had done with his brother, and he feared that what I did would cause him great political problems. So I think Nixon feared me, and I know he feared what I was doing with his brother. Okay. You purchased <laughs> land and casinos in Las Vegas. During those days, organized crime controlled much of the properties. Did you have a relationship with organized crime? In those days in Vegas, you had to be friendly with organized crime. I had a good relationship with them. They treated me honestly, and I treated them honestly. They knew that they were secure in my transactions with them. And we did what we had to do to own major parts of Las Vegas. Yeah, why did you buy the Desert Inn in Vegas? I was living in the penthouse on the whole upper floor of the Desert Inn. <clears throat> I started to have a disagreement. The people wanted me to, that owned the Desert Inn, wanted me to move. And I did not want to move, so I bought the Desert Inn. That way, I could control where I lived. <laughs> Why did you buy the Silver Slipper Casino in Vegas? <clears throat> The Silver Slipper was across the street from where I was staying, and they had this obnoxious blinking sign, and I would see the light through the drapes of the window. I kept the drapes closed because I didn't want to see what was going on outside, and this bothered me greatly. So I bought the Silver Slipper and had them tear down the sign. <laughs> Amazing. Terry Moore claimed that you married her and never got a divorce. Did you ever marry Terry Moore? I did not marry Terry Moore. We did have a relationship. She wanted to get married. And I had joked about when we were in Mexico that we could get, um, we could get married and a divorce in the same day. But <laughs> I never married her. One of our listeners would like to know what you consider your best film. I think that many of my movies were were excellent. The one that I did with John Wayne, I think I consider my best movie. Okay, how were you judged when you returned? When I returned, I was judged well 
for what I did for my charity work and for my medical institution. <clears throat> I was judged harshly for allowing my mental state and drug addiction to take over the end of my life because there were lessons that I should have learned that I didn't. I wound up basically staying in the same level where I was when I left. I regret that I did not use much more of my money to help others. But as you see, my charity today is quite large and when you invest around a billion dollars in helping others a year, you have accomplished something with your life. I did things that I shouldn't have done in business. There were times that I hurt people. For instance, when I bought RKO and laid off these 700 people. But... I also helped many. So even though there were lessons that I didn't accomplish, I did accomplish good in many different areas. I would tell anyone out there that's listening the danger of drug addiction and the fact that they should never get involved with illegal drugs. I had incredible pain through my life. If I lived today, the doctors, I think, could have done much for it. But life was what it was for me. I lived large, and I failed many things in my, life, my later life. I was blessed to have met Jane, and... I was blessed to have married her. Harold, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Do you have a final message for our listeners? <clears throat> yes. I know that many of you out there have much, have many things that you heard about me. If you're older, you probably remember some of the newspaper articles. But I did many good things. My research in aviation and my companies, I owned Transworld Airlines for a while. I helped change the vision of Las Vegas. I tried, I converted it to a town where families could visit and enjoy. <clears throat> I helped reduce the mob influence in Las Vegas. <clears throat> I did many things to help other people. The later years of my life, shall we say, absorbed all of the publicity, <clears throat> and I was truly an eccentric. Many people thought that I was crazy, and in certain respects I was. But I did leave an institution that helps many people today. So I hope people focus on that. And <clears throat> while I made many mistakes, I still did much that I think was good and indeed did help others. So thank you for inviting me to come through. I appreciate the opportunity to speak again. And thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> now we're going to speak with Jean Peters. 
Jean was born in 1926 and died in the year 2000 at the age of 73. <clears throat> she was known as a movie star of the 20th Century Fox in the late 1940s and 50s. And as you just learned, she was the second wife of Howard Hughes. She was married to him from 1957 to 1971. <clears throat> Jean, thank you so much for joining us. What was it like being a female movie star in the 1940s and 50s? It was very difficult. There were not that many studios, <clears throat> and the people that owned them were unscrupulous. When you had a contract with the studio, the individuals, the producers, the directors, the owners, they treated you with, well, they treated you like an object, something that they owned. There was nothing to protect a young woman in the movie industry during those years. If you wanted to advance, quite often it meant sleeping with the individuals that owned the studios or the directors. It was a place during the Great Depression where you could still earn a good living. All the attractive young women and young attractive men and attractive men wanted to be actors. They felt that it was a great way to gain, gain fame, a great way to get their name known, and a great way to make large amounts of money. So it was a very, very difficult place. How did you meet Howard? I met Howard in Howard was a huge person in the movie industry. During the early years, everybody wanted to meet Howard Hughes. I was under contract, but not at his studio. We were introduced, and he was a handsome and charming person. He was incredibly rich, and he was very much fun to be around. We became friends. We did not have an intimate relationship for many years. There was a time that we did, obviously. We were on again, off again with our relationship. He had his security people follow me and watch over me. And he was just an incredible person in those early days. The time before, after his major airplane accident, he changed. He started to change. But I still had great love and respect for him. Why did you retire from acting? <clears throat> when we got married, Howard wanted me to retire. He wanted me just to simply be a, a wife and to help him with his businesses. And <clears throat> we, did, we did many things. He, he helped me do charity work. He allowed me basically to do what I wanted to do. I have nothing but respect and love for Howard. Okay, you were married in 1957, as we said. What was it like being married to him at that time? It's hard to describe being married to one of the richest people in the world. Howard could do whatever, he, basically, he wanted. <clears throat> he could buy whatever he wanted, and he did on, a, on whims. For instance, he purchased the Desert Inn because they wanted him to, to give up his penthouse. <clears throat> When we got married, Howard was a w charming, handsome, wonderful person. His illnesses and the accidents changed his life. I tried to stay with him as long as I could, but 
so many things happened to him physically that it became difficult. Yeah, what were some of the changes after you were married and he had the injuries? He started to withdraw. He reached a time that he did not even want to physically be with me. We would talk on the telephone. It had been in the final years of our marriage. I would not see him for many months at a time. He simply did not want to be around anyone. He knew that he was declining physically. He knew that the drugs were taking an effect on him. He did not even he did not want me to see how he was declining physically. And I reached a point that I simply wanted to move on and live a normal life. So that that desire was really the main reason why I sought a divorce. So how did you handle that before the divorce, dealing with his problems? I still loved Howard. I realized that much of what was taking place was out of his hands. His doctors were giving him all the drugs that he wanted, all the painkillers. I knew what they were doing to him. I knew that he was so deeply involved with these drugs that there was no way he was going to be able to kick the habit. I knew that he had, had he was developing many very serious physical illnesses. I knew that his mental attitude had changed drastically. And you reach a point where you just simply have to move on, no matter how much you love a person. Whose idea was it for the two of you to divorce? Was it your idea, or did he decide on it? No, it was my idea. I came to the conclusion that things had to change. I had met another man. I had not had any relationships with him. But I felt that I could have a happy life being married to him. I simply wanted to bring bring normalcy back into my life. I thought that I might try returning to acting, but that didn't really work out. What I wanted to do was simply to return to a normal life. I did truly love Howard. I knew him when he was at his best. I knew him when he basically ruled the world. He made many decisions that gave him incredible amounts of money. When you were worth well over a billion dollars in the 1940s, you were worth a lot of money. Money was no object to him. And for me, he was very generous. When we did get our divorce, I did not want any part of his huge fortune. He paid me a yearly alimony that was fair. He 
never reneged on any of his promises to me. And even though he was in such terrible condition, he still, I think, loved me very much. Jean, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing your story. Do you have a final message for our listeners? Yes. I never, ever spoke badly of my husband. I truly did love him, and he truly loved me. Circumstances took over Howard's life. Circumstances changed things. Howard was in a condition where he suffered great pain. This pain affected him mentally. He was always very detail-oriented, sometimes to the extreme. In many ways, that was a good thing in his filmmaking. But his attention to detail could be maddening. If there was a speck of dirt or dust on my blouse, I would have to change that blouse. He had such a great fear of germs. Even though the drugs and the pills that we're taking, he was taking at the time, were killing him, he still felt that germs represented the greatest risk to his life. He had a very devoted staff. He treated them well, even through the periods where he was most reclusive. His people carried out his orders and he still had great mental acuity. He was making decisions while he isolated himself from the world that were that would change the future of Las Vegas. He wanted to change the image of the city. He wanted he bought multiple studios or multiple casinos. He bought hotels. He bought thousands of acres of land in Las Vegas. So the decisions he made are part and parcel of what you see in modern Vegas. Howard was a genius. His mind was very, very sharp. Even when he was suffering greatly from the pain, he still could tell you what was going on in all of his businesses. He was, he simply was a wonderful individual. I think that if he had not had that last plane accident, he would have set up many, many more charities. I know he was proud of the ones that he set up. I stayed married to him for many years. I think probably the last year I never laid eyes on him because I know he did not want me to see him in the condition he was in. But don't for one moment think that Howard Hughes was not an absolutely wonderful person. Yes, he did things that he shouldn't have done like we all do. But I think that the world is far better today because Howard lived. What he did, the personal risks that he took and in aviation, the risk in setting the records, flying around the world. 
He was a great pioneer, and I hope people continue to remember his name. So thank you very much for allowing me to come through tonight. I know that Howard and I truly appreciate it. Goodbye. Thank you, Gene, <coughs> and thank you again, Howard, very much. Yes, thank you so much. I really enjoyed reading about Howard. He was an incredible individual. <clears throat> okay, next week we're going to be channeling the spirit of Christopher Columbus. We're going to explore, did you know he did four voyages? I didn't. <clears throat> we're going to explore all four of his voyages. Uh, we're going to check out his policies towards the natives, what he truly accomplished, whether he thought the world was flat. There are a lot of things that we're going to cover next week, and I think that you're going to truly enjoy the show. My 10th book, Modern Messages of the Archangels, is available for purchase. It can be bought in paperback, hardcover, an ebook on Amazon. Signed copies in hardcover and softcover are available on my website, and it's barrystrom.com. During the past 20, or, geez. <coughs> During the past several years, Connie Knight channeled 20 different archangels, and we bring you their messages in a single volume. I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight on the Channeling <coughs> History. Uh, in the last three years, we've been trying very hard to bring you the truth about history by speaking to the souls that live the events. It's only by understanding the events of the past that we can prepare properly for the future. So God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Yes, the schools are taking history out of a course. If you don't know what happened in the past, you're going to make the same mistakes. So Connie and I have dedicated ourselves to trying to bring you history from the individuals that lived it. I thank you for your understanding. I'm sorry I had problems. I've been fighting COVID for the last six weeks, and I've still got problems from it. Hopefully it'll be better next week. Um, sorry we had to do reruns, but that's just the way it is. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Thank you for putting up with my coughing. <clears throat> And please join us Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Radio Network. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program with that explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com.